you to take your Bibles to the book of 1 John this morning. Fort Knox is an army base located in Kentucky that contains half of the gold reserves of the U.S. It is estimated to contain nearly $300 billion of gold. If anyone was ever thinking about, if you were ever thinking about stealing that gold, you would encounter a few obstacles. Uh, four fences, including electric ones, armed guards, video surveillance, four foot thick walls reinforced by 750 tons of steel, a maze of doors, a 22 ton steel vault door, and even if you were able to get to the door, you need the combination which is split up amongst all the employees who don't know each other's codes. And if you were able to get past this, there's just the small matter of 30,000 soldiers on the base. It's safe to say the gold is pretty secure, but theoretically, it could still be stolen. Um, of far greater worth, and let me say, this is way more important for us, is eternal life. And what I just described to you doesn't compare to the security that we have in our eternal life. And I want to explain why, because earthly treasure fades, it can be gone. But eternal treasure, the eternal life found in Jesus Christ, if you know him, it is guaranteed. And it's guaranteed by God himself. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at this text, help us to understand why when we know Christ, we truly are secure. I pray your wisdom and guidance. May the Holy Spirit help us to have understanding. And we thank you that Jesus has made it possible for us to have eternal life. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence uh, that we have toward him. Now, why did I read that first? Because the whole thing is about that, even though we're going to get to that verse in a little bit. So now, let's just read verses 6 to 12. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. Now, the first part of 1 John chapter 5 is a monument to the sure and certain victory, so that first part of the chapter, of our victory in Christ, that we have overcome through him because Christ has overcome the world. If verses 1 to 5 concern themselves with the surety of victory, then verses 6 to 12 help us to understand the value and the depth and the security of our victory. To overcome is to inherit eternal life. And so this section is a little bit challenging, but we'll see very soon that it's well worth the effort to dig into it. And the biblical truth that it contains is so encouraging for us. So like I said, if you wanted to define this, you go to verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may have eternal life. Now, this epistle was written, as I've stated before, during a time of strife when the church faced challenges of heretical teachings trying to lure people away from biblical truth. Very much the case today. Still true. Some of the contentious things that the early church faced was the nature of Jesus. Was he merely a man? Was he God? Was he just a ghost? And though it had not fully come into a full argument yet, there would be challenges to the idea of the Trinity, that there is a 
one God expressed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So to hold to the same teaching as the apostles and the early church, one must hold to the belief in the Trinity. To reject the Trinity is to reject biblical teaching. And so, essentially, if you deny the Trinity, you believe false doctrine. Now, there are false teachers today who will deny the Trinity. And anybody who does deny the Trinity, immediately you know there's a red flag right off the bat. That's a great warning sign for us. The passage, even though I wouldn't call it overly obvious, definitely is Trinitarian in nature. Um, it demands an acknowledgement of Trinitarian doctrine for true faith. In verse 5, Jesus is the Son of God. In verse 6, it says that he came by the water and the blood. And not just by water, but by both. And the Spirit testifies to this because it is the Spirit of truth. Now, there are a lot of complicated theories by scholars on what this all means, but I'm going to simplify this, and I think I'm going to just say that there's a very straightforward explanation in scriptures regarding the water. Now, if you take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 3 for a minute. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. And I will say this is definitely a passage that is debated. However, we're going to come out with some truth that isn't debated by those who hold to solid doctrine. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee from, to, to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and then Jesus was baptized. Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus came by water. He was baptized in the Jordan River. But there's a lot going on there, isn't there? Because is Jesus the only one there? No. We see the whole Trinity present. The Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit was present. Clearly, for Jesus to come by water, one must believe that the Father sent him because you have, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And of course, as I said, the third person of the Trinity is there. Now, the Holy Spirit was with Jesus during his time on earth, and some heretics would agree, yes, Jesus came by water. Now, they didn't necessarily think about it the way we think about it. They might have said that the Holy Spirit was a kind of spiritual power that Jesus received some kind of mystical empowerment upon him. But they wouldn't accept something, in which, which John says, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. They would deny that Jesus would come in the flesh and need to die in order to redeem humanity. Which is why John says, not by water only, but by water and blood. Spirit-empowered as well. But Jesus had to come in the flesh and he had to shed his own blood in order to redeem sinners. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4 says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. Hebrews 10.10. 10. And by this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So this is a fundamental doctrine of our soteriology. In other words, what we believe about salvation. That Jesus died on a cross and shed his blood for us. Without the shedding of Jesus' blood, no one would be forgiven of their sin. So heretics viewed the church, or sorry, viewed de the death of Christ as completely 
unnecessary. And there are modern movements, even within the church today, that want to de-emphasize the necessity of Christ's shed blood. The cross is too graphic, too disturbing, and too dark. It's not a hurrah, hurrah, cheer everybody along kind of thing. But Christ did not go to the cross for his sin. The horror of the cross is that the perfect Son of God shed his blood for our sin. We can never shy away from that truth because the ugly reality is that he had to die, the perfect spotless lamb, in order that we might live and be forgiven. That's why it says, not by water only, but by the water and the blood, because salvation is impossible without Christ dying on the cross. And of course, we know that the Holy Spirit testifies to the truth that salvation is found in Christ alone. The Holy Spirit, as we're told in the book of John, confirms the truth regarding Jesus Christ. John 16 says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, verse 7 has been an interesting verse. Here, in many translations, it's just very simple. It says, for these are three that testify. And I just want to take you on a little bit of an excursus, a little bit of a journey because I just want to point out something. People have used this particular verse in ways that just really try to divide the body of Christ, but it's unnecessary. Now, if you have a, a King James or a New King James, you do not have the same sentence there. Your translation will say, uh, there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now that is pretty powerful Trinitarian statement, isn't it? And of course, the immediate reaction is then all other translations are terrible, and that because what does our translations typically say? Well, the modern ones typically read, for there are three that testify. Now you can understand why people might get up in arms about this, but I wanna kinda show you why sometimes we chase after the wrong things. So the argument goes that the modern translations are leaving this out and making this less Trinitarian. But the bottom line is, <laughs> this is called the Johannine comma. In other words, this is not, that little phrase that I read to you in the King James is not in the original manuscripts. Um, the, the King James, when it was translated, and I, you know, it's a very faithful translation. I'm not against it at all. But it was, it was translated from, from documents that were not as old as what we have now. And here's the interesting thing. Since that time, older manuscripts have been found. None of them have that phrase in it. None of the early church fathers refer to it. And even the people who translated the King James were not sure whether to put that in there. Now, what this has caused, unfortunately, is people saying that, well, they're trying to diminish the Trinity. And what I want to point out is that sometimes as Christians, we make these kind of like mountains out of a molehill that is irrelevant because verse 8 says, the spirit, the water, and the blood, these three testify and when you look at, the, at this passage, you'll understand that it is no less Trinitarian just because of that thing. And what I'm getting at is that sometimes we enter into fruitless debates. We need to be in the right kind of places standing for truth. We need to stand for Jesus being God, Jesus being the only way. We definitely need to believe in the Trinity, but sometimes we get distracted over Bible translation wars and things like this. But take the context of this passage and what I said in verse eight, and you'll see very clearly that it's much ado about nothing because 
It's completely Trinitarian the whole way through. Now, what did we say about the water? Who was present at Jesus' baptism? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's no reduction of a Trinitarian reference whatsoever. If you were to go further into Scripture, by the blood, what do we know about Jesus' shed blood? In John 3, 16, who sent the Son? For God so loved the world, right, that he sent his one and only Son. Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God the Father is completely present in the concept of the blood. And then the Spirit. Well, John 14, 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have told you. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are here no matter what. You can't get away from the fact that God is clearly Trinitarian. He's clearly one God, three persons expressed. Now, there are no shortage of verses in the, uh, on the Trinity in the scriptures that just kind of build upon that. But what I'm just getting at is that it's not even necessary for it to say what I said about the King James for you to say the Trinity is here. And that's really important for us to understand because intrinsically the Trinity is not a product of our imaginations. It is not something that just some people believe and some don't. It is inherently a doctrine of Scripture that is essential in our faith. And we need to continue to see that. So, what happens out of this? Well, verse 9. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God, that he has born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. So, the testimony of man is legitimate. Now, what is he talking about? Well, we already know from 1 John that the apostles bore witness. So, it's not just saying that anybody just off the street. We're talking about those who witnessed the resurrection of Christ, who were also with him. So, this is a, a very valid witness. But here's what we have. The greater testimony than any man is the testimony of God himself. And so God the Father affirms Jesus at his baptism. My beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But Think about how Jesus is affirmed over and over again. God's testimony of himself. You see, God doesn't require you and I to affirm the truth of who he is. He is who he is. And it's regardless of anyone's opinion. He speaks of himself. I mean, think about Jesus when he's on the cross and in the temple. It says in Matthew 27, verse 51, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they went into the holiest city and appeared to many. The power of God spoke for itself. By the way, Read those verses over again to yourself sometime. That's some crazy stuff going on in just like two verses. The water and the blood agree, but so does the Holy Spirit. Because what was the Spirit's testimony? Well, Romans 8, 11, The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And so... He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. When God testifies of his son, it is the greater testimony and we accept it. There is no neutrality regarding this fact. You see, God, when he sent his son Jesus to die for sinners, the most loving act, I mean, 
does not the book of 1 John define love as Jesus coming and dying for us, right? But to reject Jesus, you are rejecting the Trinity because you're rejecting the love of the Father. You are rejecting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because we're making God out to be a liar, as the text says. Now, what are we saying when we make God out to liar? What we're saying is, everything that you did, God, I don't need to do. I don't need, just because your son died, I don't need to repent of my sins. I don't need to believe in you. And God sent his son saying, yes, you do. You absolutely do. And so if you do not do those things, you're making God out to be a liar, so to speak. We are rejecting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. To reject your need of salvation is the only unforgivable sin. Because by rejecting it, you are denying your need of Jesus Christ and that you need to repent and believe. Matthew 12 talks about this. It says, I will tell you that every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Let me be clear, because people wrestle with this sometimes. People have definitely, over time, rejected Jesus the first time they heard him. What this is talking about, the unforgivable sin, it's not that if you one time reject Jesus, you can never be saved. But let's put it this way. Whoever goes to the grave rejecting Jesus Christ, that is the unforgivable sin. You will not be saved. You have to repent and believe, or you will spend eternity in hell. So now is the time to repent and believe. But the third thing, let's let's look at this third piece of this, verse 11 to 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So we've already been saying that, that whoever does not believe in Christ does not have life. The great testimony that is affirmed to us by the water, by the blood, by the Spirit, is that God gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And I hope that that just thrills your heart and soul this morning. But I said earlier that our hope is more secure than anything on this earth, including Fort Knox. That is, our eternal life in heaven is guaranteed by God himself. Every one of us is eternal, but only those who know Christ will enjoy eternal life. Those who do not will, will know eternal condemnation. Matthew 25, 46 says, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So Fort Knox has nothing on our security. Nothing. Because you and I didn't secure our eternal life. Christ did. And here's what I want to say, because if you don't know Jesus, you don't have that security. But now you said, oh, was this just an intellectual exercise in doctrine where we had to say we affirm the Trinity? What does that really matter? Can I tell you, here's a very practical outline of why we must believe in the Trinity and why there's great value in believing in the Trinity, because I'm going to tell you something. We, if it was up to us to keep ourselves saved, we're cooked. Our goose is cooked. But if we trust God to save us, we are secure. <laughs> now we just went on about how much how important the Trinity is. Now let's put this into real time. John 10, turn there. You need to see these verses. John chapter 10, please. John chapter 10, verse 28 says, this is Jesus, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
That alone is a hallelujah truth, isn't it? Oh, wait, it gets better. There's more. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Think about this. Jesus says, I give you eternal life, and no one can perish when I give them eternal life. No one can snatch you from my hand. Jesus has you, and nothing can pull you from Jesus. And he says, by the way, if that wasn't enough, right? That is enough. But guess what? The Father who gave you to Jesus says, no one can snatch them from his hand. He is greater than all. Now that doesn't mean that he's better than Jesus. What it means is positionally, he's at the top of the Trinity. He, Jesus submitted to him. He's greater than all. But as Jesus has you, the Father has you. And no one can snatch you out of the Father's hands either. Not even yourself. You can't do anything if you're in Christ to lose your salvation. Now you have to truly believe. You have to repent and believe. And God does that work in us and by conviction. But when you are his, he says, I give you eternal life. Now, if Jesus promises this, how secure are we? Can we even, should we even worry? You know what? I'm glad those verses are there because as a sinner saved by a grace, there are days where emotionally I don't feel that. There are days when I'm discouraged. There are days when I don't feel the power of God in my life because I'm a sinner saved by grace. Now, I've been forgiven. But what locks me into eternal life is not my feelings. And thank goodness it's not my faithfulness either. Although, if I come to know Christ, I want to be faithful. This is motivation for that, isn't it? But out of joy, not out of bondage. And by the way, we, we, we didn't cover one. We covered two aspects of the Trinity. Ephesians chapter 4 says this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You cannot be snatched from the Son who grants you eternal life. You cannot be snatched from the Father who is greater than all and you are sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. You are truly secure in God. And there is a great value in believing in the Trinity. Because you've got that triple guarantee that God is keeping you in eternal life. Each person of the Trinity promises to keep you and to save you. How wonderful is that? The testimony of God is clear. You inherit eternal life because God guarantees it. And that is true security and hope. Now, I'm going to get dangerous here for a moment in closing. Because I'm going to talk about politics. Don't worry. We're not going to get on one side or the other of the coin. I think it's just fascinating to watch something here. If anybody witnessed the debate between the American president and former American president. The only thing I could say was if you were in favor of Joe Biden at that point, your hope was just washed away 
in that debate. Now, I said, I'm not trying to, we're not Americans, and in fact, as Christians, we shouldn't be obsessed with politics, but it really hit home for me. Just watching them, they, they were so sure that Joe Biden would smack Trump around. And he got up there, and he could barely keep his thoughts together. And you could see the panic and the sorrow, because what people, and I'm talking more about the psychological phenomenon here of anything, is that people were so sure and so hopeful going into that, and by the end of it, they were panicking. They had lost all sense of security. And I say, don't make the mistake here either. We trust sometimes in our politicians too much instead of God. And you know, some people are like, whoa, Polyev will save us from Trudeau. We need God. We need God to save us. And I said, it's dangerous to get into politics because, you know, every church I've been in, somebody's mad at me because I dissed their preferred political candidate. God bless you. I'm going to run out the door right after this, but... Do you really think that any politician is going to keep all their promises? We need to pray for them, but don't get caught up in that. What I'm saying is none of these things in the earth can keep everything together. But when we trust God with the things that actually matter, we actually have security. And we will never be disappointed with what God does. And he will never throw a curveball at us of disappointment because he wasn't strong enough to overcome because he's already overcome. And that's why you can live your life out with that security for God's glory. You can fight for your marriage. You can endure persecution at home, at work, with your friends. You can fight against sin. You can battle against mental health. It's worth it. Spiritual warfare, sickness, it's worth enduring it all because we are secure in Christ, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And when all these things are gone, including debates by politicians, we will be in heaven with Christ forever. That's a promise from his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that we can hold to the hope in scriptures. We thank you that we know that we have eternal life because the Father guarantees it, the Son guarantees it, and the Holy Spirit guarantees it. May we trust not in the things of man but may we with the hope of eternal life live boldly and faithfully to the glory of you O oh god we pray this in jesus name amen worship team